have 30 years of volunteer work, community organizing, and 16 years in local government. 12 of those as mayor. Wimmer's Wilderness is an informed look at politics, community, government, environment, and education from a local perspective. Today we're joined by Marissa Fortin of Spring Hill Heritage Farm. Um, Marissa, I, I kind of got introduced to you looking, um, I, I think originally on Instagram, and you're set up in Chitek, Wisconsin, which is where I have my bees and, and do all my um, candle making and lip balm making and all that good stuff. And I was just really fascinated by your approach to have some of the, the, the best raised and tasting meats available and, and kind of what got you into that and, and what got you to this, to this point in your life? Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I grew up on a farm. In fact, I grew up on this farm. My father was a dairy farmer. And so I've always loved farming and loved taking care of livestock. But I kind of had to go sow my oats. They weren't very wild, but they were still oats. <laughs> so I grew up. I became a registered nurse. I lived in Milwaukee for quite some time. And that was a great segment of my life but I always wanted to return to the country and to farming and to raising livestock. So in 2016, my husband Stefan and I returned from Milwaukee. We purchased the family farm, and we very slowly but surely started raising animals. And we started with just laying hens, then we, um, we added pastured meat chickens, and we started with just four pigs. We used to think that maybe we wanted to do beef, but then we tried pigs, and as it turns out, we love raising pigs on pasture. So things just grew a little bit every year. Um, I think officially 2018 would be the first year that we were in business. We were incredibly small with just a few hundred pasture chickens and only four pigs. So we have um, significantly grown since then, although we're still certainly on the small side. And we were, we're now producing... Um, pastured pork and pastured chicken, and we do a combination with the pork of bulk meat that's sold by the half and the whole, and then we also um, obtained our meat retail license to sell pork that is individually cut. And since we only do chicken and pork, we're kind of interested in other things such as lamb, but we're not there yet. But ultimately, we thought, you know, there's there's a large variety of meat, and is it reasonable for just one small family farm to produce everything and really know what we're doing? And during that time, we had become friends with Amber and Logan Dwyer, who are neighbors of ours. And in fact, Amber grew up on a dairy farm about a mile south of me. We're fairly far apart in age, so I hadn't known her growing up, but we're from the very same neighborhood. So she and her husband had... Um, purchased his family farm, and we're doing something very similar to us. And they have very similar values, raise their animals in the same way. They do some chicken, but their primary focus is beef and turkey, all on pasture. So we decided to just start working together. And instead of, you know, each farm trying to do all the things, we decided to work together as much as we can and really favor collaboration over competition. So we've both been growing kind of together, kind of separate, and so we have technically separate farms. We just do a lot of things together to make life easier. Um, for example, everything from both of our farms is available for sale on our website. So customers can purchase um, both poultry, chicken and turkey, and both red meat, pork and beef. They can make them in one purchase online, and then they can pick them up on either of our farms, and then we also ship throughout the upper Midwest. And, and so there's a lot of behind. And get some good uh, Shitek uh, maple, it looks like, as well. We do. We do have maple syrup. We haven't quite figured out how to ship that yet. <laughs> um, and I will say that neither one of us produces the maple syrup, but our wonderful neighbor, Rod Flug, he is a retired dairy farmer who lives about a mile north of us. And he hand harvests maple sap and boils it down over an honest-to-goodness wood fire and produces these amazing maple products. So those are available for purchase on the website and pick up as well. Um, it's a little bit shy of retail because I just funnel it straight to him. Like, he's just wonderful, and I'm, I'm very happy to uh, provide a pickup source. 
So essentially they order it online and I'm like, hey, Rod, I need this. And so I, I go get it for pickup. And so there's certainly a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes because neither of the farms have all of the products at both locations. So we do a lot of stopping at each other's places in preparation for pickups. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, and in one of the locations where I work at, at my day job, um, Amber and Logan live kind of like on the way home. So there are plenty of evenings where I stop at their farm and then I proceed home. And it just depends on how long we talk before I get in the car again to see how long that takes. Right, right. So well, the advantage is <laughs> two, two, two minutes so of business and two, two minutes of business and about 20 minutes of, of good talking, right? Oh, that absolutely happens. <laughs> Plus, they have the cutest little girl, and I always have to see her. She's a little buddy. So there's a lot of stuff to make it happen behind the scenes, but it's well worth it. you know. And, and in the future, as we grow, we'd certainly like to have things more streamlined. But for now, one of our big focuses is that we want our customers to be able to get everything. You know, Instead of having to make purchases at two separate farms, go to two separate farms, have transactions at two separate farms, this way they can just order everything they want and pick it up in one place. And it's the same concept with our shipping. We ship our products together so that customers can order all four types of meats that they want and have them shipped together and just use one website, get to know, you know, one farm online, even though it's kind of two farms from behind the scenes. But it's a lot more convenient for them. And, you know, we really value the whole concept of collaboration over competition because neither one of us loses anything by supporting the other and, and collaborating in our business. And it's been a real blessing in many ways because there are times where I'm like, I'm just too busy doing this, so they'll step in and vice versa. Yeah, and that sounds phenomenal because oftentimes at any scale, and I, you know, my, my previous, one of my previous lives, um, I worked in, in business finance and you know, helping companies um, get up and going. And oftentimes, even the, the smallest companies can feel like they're in an uber competitive environment and not look at those great collaboration opportunities. And this sounds just amazing. And it you have to have a fair amount of trust as you're going into this as well. Oh, most certainly. So as, as you kind of started down this process, did you look at, because when I, you know, started with, with my bees and, and honey and stuff, I started looking at, okay, what are the regulations? What aren't the regular, you know, because everything's a little bit different where, wherever you're, you're at. How did you kind of navigate that whole process? Well, I have to say that BATCP in Barron County is extremely supportive of small farmers. And, and, and can I'm you really say what that. that acronym is? Oh, boy. You know, or, or just I would really have to look at it. <laughs> just, just sum it up what, what, what they do and what they're, what, what they're supposed to be doing. Essentially, they are, um, they are the regulators for um, small food producers and kind of direct-to-consumer mm -hmm. providers. So they were and able to help guide you along and what you, what you need, what process and what your facility should be and how you should, should manage all the different products that you're, you're selling? Exactly, and there's a lot of resources available online. I have to say Wisconsin does a really good job of that. Of you know, There are actual brochures that you can get online um, on the, gov the Wisconsin government website that are very specifically designed for farm-to-consumer meat producers. And so they're, they're pretty clear language. Now, I have a tendency to be, um, I always want to make sure that my I's are dotted and my T's are mm -hmm. crossed. And I remember that when I was looking for the meat retail license so that we could obtain our county license to sell individual cuts of meat out of our um, farm store, um, I, was, I was reading all of this. I was reading way too into it, <laughs> and I was so concerned about, like, getting all these things. And I sent an email, you know, requesting, um, like, an inspection and anything I should prepare for, and do you need a HACCP plan written out, and all these things. And I got this wonderful, kind email back saying, it's okay, Marissa. You're making this way more difficult than it needs to be. I think you've got everything covered. This is what we need. No, no. <laughs> it was so great. I was just, I was really appreciative because I was so worried that it was going to be really complex and that I wasn't going to pass and that they were going to find all these things wrong, you know, with my, with my little on my 
Four Season Porch Farm Store. <laughs> um, but in fact, that wasn't the case at all. And I, I have heard horror stories from other states and other counties mm-hmm. of inspectors who are almost anti-small farmers. Yeah. And we're really fortunate that's not the case at all. Um, Barron County is a really good resource. There are a lot of us in this area who are very small farm-to-consumer meat producers. And we really have, I haven't even heard of anybody else having a bad experience with Barron County. So they're happy to answer questions, and they're a really good resource. So when you kind of started doing this process, was this something that you've always wanted to do? Um, as you said, you know, you're kind of, you know, you're down in Milwaukee and you came back and you bought the family farm. Did you envision this, you know, five years before you started doing it? Or did you kind of, as you got into this, were like, you know, this would be a really great thing to do? Because um, I, I do want to ask you a couple of questions, too, about the differing types of, you know, um, you, know, you have free range, locally fed, low stress, pasture rate, you know, all the different meanings of that and, and why that is important to you as well. Certainly. So I've really always loved farming. Um, when I was a kid, I don't know that I really wanted to ever take over the dairy farm. Um, a lot of that is just because of the twice a day milking and simply because um, it wasn't, it just well, so you have not to be, profitable. Right. And you have to be a, a large enough size. You know, I I'm, I'm come from a, a farming family as well. And, you know, you have for, for dairy farming, you know, it used to be if you had 50 to 80 head, now you have to have several hundred head just to, to, you know, break even essentially. Yeah, that's exactly it. So it never really appeared to me. Like I always liked dairy cows themselves, but I really didn't want to be a dairy farmer. Um, but I just like raising livestock. I like the rural live, uh, lifestyle. I like being a farmer. And I find something very satisfying about producing food in general. So I think when we were kind of getting to the point of, you know, we were in Milwaukee for a decade. and I, I we probably I'm started... sorry for that. I, I have a lot of family <laughs> in Milwaukee who visited. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a small-town country boy myself, so I'm, I'm not a big, big city person. We really found, like, we, we, we really wanted that experience, <laughs> and we loved it, and we had, like, some wonderful friends there, and we lived right smack dab in the middle of the city, and we had a great experience. But we were also ready to leave, yeah. you know, at the end of those 10 years. I'm like, I want to go home, and I want to go back to my tiny little small town and live in the middle of nowhere. So I think about five years before we actually left, uh, we started talking about farming and what would that look like. And, of course, in a way, I was starting from scratch. Not really. I mean, I, I had a farming background, but I knew that I wasn't going to do dairy. So then trying to figure out, like, okay, what would that look like, and How could we potentially, you know, even have some income from this? And originally, I don't know that I even thought about pursuing it as, like, a supporting um, business. Mm -hmm. Um, As time went on, I kind of realized, like, no, I really want to make something of this. Like, I want this to be our career. Mm -hmm. But it really took a while to get there. I think originally, I just always thought about beef because I grew up raising cows, So it was kind of a logical transition to think, well, I'll do beef. And as time went on, um, and and I will say, I think even when we first moved here in 2016, I kind of thought, we're going to do beef. But a few things made me realize that maybe that wouldn't be the best fit for us. Um, One of them is just the realization that a whole bunch of other people around here already do beef. Mm -hmm. So would it really be that beneficial to add, you know, one more small producer of beef? And when I didn't really know what I was doing to begin with, so I'm like, well, I got to figure out something from scratch anyway. So then we started planting chickens just because that's a pretty easy thing to kind of on-ramp to. You know, it doesn't require a ton of investment. It's a a fairly short turnaround time. I'm like, well, I've raised chickens before, and so I can do that. So we um, first we did laying hens. And um, and then the next year we started doing pasture chickens, and I read the stress-free chicken tractor by John Siskovich, and we made four chicken tractors exactly according to the book directions, and mm-hmm. we just did everything he said, and it worked. <laughs> and so we started doing our chickens. That was 2018, and that same year, I had maybe thought about pigs, and I will admit that it was partially because I think they're cute, <laughs> but also it was just that it's something different. You know, if 
um, if, if pork is, I'm sorry, if beef is being produced everywhere, well, I don't see a lot of people raising pork. Mm -hmm. And then one day in, um, I think it was early June of 2018, uh, my friend Tanya called me. She's like, hey, Marissa, I just got a call that my friend's cousin who raises pigs has a bunch of runts and he's selling them for like 20 bucks each. So I'm going to get a couple and raise them. Do you want some? <laughs> and I had one of the few spontaneous moments of my life. Like I'm usually a person <laughs> who plans everything to the T. Uh -huh. But at that moment, I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I'm like, get me four of them. So soon after, here she comes <laughs> with like a dog kennel with these four little pigs. Mm -hmm. And that is how I became a pig farmer. Well, we had, uh, we had a, when I was growing up, um, on my mom's side, they had larger dairy operations, but my dad was a truck driver. And so we had a 40 acre hobby farm used to be my, uh, grandpa's, uh, Fox ranch. And so we had a little bit of everything. We had cows, we had horses, we had pigs, we had goats, um, chickens, of course, and stuff. And I would get my money by selling the eggs at the co-op when I was growing up from, from, from the chickens. And then, um, one of the funnest things that we always would do would be go, ride the uh, sows when we were like six, seven years old and they'd go, you know, running around as we're riding on their backs and uh -huh. stuff, which was a lot of fun. I've always loved pigs. I don't know why people are so down on them, but they're just, I think they're just fascinating. You have to show them a lot of respect when they have their, you know, their little piglets, um, you know, initially and stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I, they're, and they're, they're highly intelligent. They're great to work with. Yeah, they are. We really enjoy them. And you know, we found raising them on pasture there, they really don't stink when they have plenty of room. Right. And they're just so happy out there. And, you know, they're so cute. Like the cute thing was not a lie. When they're running through the field and their ears are flopping, uh -huh. like they're adorable. Oh, yes. Yep. I, 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 I it's yeah, great to just, hear that. We, yeah, it's, it's really a blessing. It's great to see them in an environment that they enjoy. And so we just bought some um, portable electric netting fence, okay. and we got an old, we got like an old shipping crate and made a shelter out of it. And of course, they were just little at the time, and there was just four of them. So we were really able to kind of, kind of wing it with mm -hmm. just four pigs. And we learned that we really liked it. And um, so we kept, uh, we kept one for ourselves, and then just you know a handful of people who we knew were interested. And so we sold them by the halves and the holes. Um, brought them to the butcher, mm -hmm. and it went really well. And the pork was delicious. Um, everybody who everybody who purchased a pig that year is still a customer. And that's the and so, the, the greatest acknowledgement of, of what you're doing. Yeah, it's it's been really, really great. You know, to see that to see that return of like, yep, we're doing this again. You got a pig for me? Like, yep, I sure do. <laughs> So in 2019, we went up to 12 pigs, and we still did them only by the half and the whole, and that worked out great. And then the next year, so then 2020 hit, and we decided that, well, people are looking for food, and we're going to provide food, and we just decided that, well, we've been wanting to expand and to increase, and we're going to take our opportunity. And then some, a friend of a friend um, had a lot of young pigs and was very concerned about being – like, he's not a farm-to-table operation. Mm -hmm. He was really concerned about where they were going to go and um, because their buyers were being lost. Of course, that's, you know, the beginning of, of 2020, and the pandemic is hitting hard, and they're shut down. And so we talked, and we purchased, I think it was 26 wiener pigs from this farmer and raised them. So that was how we got into this, like, oh, goodness, here we go. <laughs> like, we're really doing this. And, uh, you know, there were definitely moments from, like, what have we done? <laughs> and, you know, we had to, you know, figure out, like, larger shelter, um, better systems for watering and feeding. And so there were definitely times where we're like, what are we doing? We don't know what we're doing. Um, but we figured it out, and it, it worked really well. And that was the year that... Um, so we kept doing halves and holes. We went up to 16 pigs, raising for half and holes, and that goes to a custom exempt butcher where people buy the live animal or share it, okay, and then yep. they get custom butchering and pick up their meat from the butcher. But 2020 was the year that we also started working with a USDA-inspected butcher. 
So we take them in, we pay for the butchering up front, and then we get the cuts back and we obtained our meat retail license from Barron County, and that's when we began selling individual cuts of meat. And it went really well. And, you know, people would come get our meat and they'd be like, you know, this is the best chicken or the best pork that I've had since I was a kid growing up on a farm. And that's kind of when we realized that, like, this might actually work. And we really like it. You know, it's so incredibly satisfying to produce this amazing food for people in our community. So the other thing we realized, um, raising, I think we, we only did 200-some meat chickens because we just couldn't get enough chicks that year. Mm-hmm. Um, but we realized that with 26 pigs and 200-plus um, meat chickens, is that we were absolutely at our limit. Um, my husband is a diesel mechanic by trade. Okay. He was working like 50 hours a week. Yep. I'm a registered nurse. I was working 32 hours a week. And we made it through 2020 by the skin of our teeth. And we were so absolutely exhausted by the time we got all of our animals butchered. And we just kind of collapsed at the end. And it, it took a while of almost recovery to even <laughs> figure out oh my gosh, do we want to do this again? (laughs) But we ultimately decided that we want to do this again, but we realized that that had brought us to a crossroads. Mm -hmm. Like we are either going to increase more and we're going to have someone be a full-time farmer and we're going to, we're going to do this and we're going to be professionals and we're going to grow and we're going to make this a real business. And that's just what we focus on. Mm -hmm. Or we're going to go in the other direction and we're just going to be hobby farmers and we're just going to raise enough for us maybe immediate family and a couple of friends, and that's it. Um, because we, we cannot both have full-time jobs and do this to this level. It was right. just it was just untenable. And so we kind of spent the winter really figuring things out. And over the winter was when I built the new website to see now where mm-hmm. you can order online. And that's also when I figured out uh, shipping and getting that going. And it's also when I reached out to Amber and Logan. And Amber and I spent a solid three hours at the local Hope and Anchor coffee shop. Which is a great coffee shop for anybody. It. Isn't it I, wonderful? Like, I had to week. throw it out there. Oh, well, yeah. No, so no, it's great. It's great. Mm-hmm. And, like, highly, highly recommend. Yes. And so, you know, we spent, like, a three-hour planning session one afternoon figuring out, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? You do this. I'll do this. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, we decided that, um, that, yes, we can make this a business. And we can make this a supporting business. So Stefan left his diesel mechanic job in early April. Um, I kept my job because I like being a nurse. But also, I had less of a commute. I have better health insurance. Right. And my job is a lot more flexible. You know, I can you can be a full-time nurse. It's very difficult to be a full-time diesel mechanic. So even though, interestingly enough, I'm probably the one that likes farming more. He likes it well <laughs> enough to do it, and fortunately, the man loves me. Yeah, so, yeah that, that always helps. It really does. <laughs> I mean, I like to tease him that back in 98, he made a terrible decision, and now he's stuck with it. But for oh. the most part, he seems okay with it, and it's worked out very well. Well, that's the same so year that, that I left. got married as well, so good year. Oh, nice. Yes. It was a good year. Yes. And so he left his position and became a full-time farmer, and we have been thankful for that ever since. Um, We have gone through this year. uh, We went back to getting 300-plus chickens. We did uh, 28 hogs, Mm -hmm. and we've had many moments this year of wondering how in the world we did it last year. So we're very, very glad and um, that we now have a full-time farmer. And so it's also meant me doing less of the physical chores, which I will say I miss. Like, I I really want to get to a place again where I have the time to do more of the hands-on farming chores because mm-hmm. I really enjoy them. But it has given me the opportunity to do a lot more behind-the-scenes work, marketing, um, making the website better, and getting information out there so that we can really grow the actual business. Because one thing I've learned is that – Raising livestock is really just a tiny fraction of this whole concept of farm to table. And I knew nothing about business. I mean, they don't teach marketing in nursing school. I mean, I've, I, I keep 
thinking of the times when I was getting my bachelor's degree and I walked by the School of Business and I never once thought that I should take some classes there. <laughs> and I wish that I had um, because it's been a really big learning curve. And of I like to joke that as a nurse, I've never had to market myself. It's like, here's my resume. When can you start? Exactly. And that was the extent of it. <laughs> so, so I was really spoiled in that sense. So trying to figure out how to market myself as a farmer with something to offer was just a really big learning curve. And so, and actually, if I can throw out one resource, I took um, Kelsey Jorison's Cultivating Capital course. Um, it's an online course, and it's marketing for farmers. It was an absolute godsend. Um, it was the things that I needed to know explained to me well, and it was it was really, really crucial. Like, I don't know what I would have done without that course. It made all the difference in the world. Um, because for someone like me, pretty much starting from scratch, I didn't even know where to start. And I still, like, go through the course, and I'm trying to, like, glean more and improve things as time goes on. Um, but that was a, it was a really big learning curve for me. But I, I kind of enjoy it once I'm getting there. And we do have a running joke that our real motto of the farm is, we don't know what we're doing, but we're doing it anyway. Um, we don't advertise that, but that really is <laughs> some level of truth. Well, that, that kind of... But looking back, it's also amazing how much we have actually learned and figured out along the way. Well, being open to, to that and realizing that you don't know a lot about what it is you're doing and you're not you know, stubborn, okay, we're going to do it this way no matter what kind of thing, but you're open to those ideas and, and really wanting to learn um, helps out a, a lot. The question that I, you know, always get whenever I, uh, you know, kind of see an operation like this, and I have even, you know, doing, you know, starting out, because um, each year now, this is my third year doing my bees, um, next year looking at um, doubling the, the size of what I have and, you know, kind of like what where you're at, is this really what I want to do or not want to do? Do you find, um, you know, because when you're smaller, you you know, you don't need as many sales to, to, to sell out of everything. Are you reaching a point where you really need to kind of market yourself or is there just so much demand to have, um, you know, good high quality meat raised in an ethical way, in a, um, you know, a healthy way that, you're, you're kind of trying to fill a demand that's already there. You know, I, I think that's kind of an interesting um, topic to, to explore here. So if, if, if you have uh, a lot of great wisdom to share with us, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, we, we are definitely having to market ourselves. Um, one thing that is a challenge is that we are in a fairly low income area mm -hmm. and our products are more high end. Yes. And I often wish it wasn't that way. Like, I really wish that I could offer products that are affordable to absolutely everybody because I think everybody should be able to access local, well-raised food. But the reality is, in order for us to have any level of profit, um, we have to have fairly high prices. And that just reflects all the work that goes into raising these animals. Well, and it But that also makes the marketing a little more challenging because, you know, the... The easy marketing is people who know us and people who are local to the community. And we reach out more and more and reach those people. However, in a fairly low income, fairly rural area, there is not a huge market of people who are looking for what we offer at the price point we offer. And that was a big reason that we decided to get into shipping because shipping really allows us to reach a bigger customer base of people who are interested in our product at the price point that we offer it. You know, long term, I certainly have dreams of becoming more efficient and being able to decrease our prices to make it more accessible. Um, because I really, I want people in, I, I, my dream would be that like everybody in Shatek um, and the surrounding area bought directly from a farmer, whether that's me or another farmer, right. um, because I want all farmers to succeed. And I firmly believe that a rising tide lifts all boats when it comes to farm to consumer um, producing. Um, but that's just not the way it is now. So since it's not, I need to figure out how to reach my target customer. And that meant shipping. And that definitely means learning about marketing, which is 
why I took Kelsey's course, which has helped so much because I had no idea how to do that. And I'm still learning. Like, it's still very much a process, and I still feel awkward as I'll get out when I put my face <laughs> on my Instagram stories. <laughs> and I find myself thinking, like, am I really filming myself walking to the wood stove? Yep, I sure am. Yep. Why am I doing this? Nobody wants to see this. This is ridiculous. I don't even look good right now. But <laughs> but I do it anyway because I, I, I know that a lot of people, like, they want that glimpse into farm life, and they want to know their farmer. And, you know, messy hair, lack of makeup, just woke up face. It's still me and I'm the farmer and here I am and thank you so much for watching even though I kind of feel ridiculous and I don't know what I'm doing. But I'm doing it anyway. Um, so that's definitely the part of marketing that is necessary but also a challenge is to, to reach out to people who are looking for my product because I believe that the demand is absolutely there. The question is, you know, how do we match up between the farmer who has the product and the, the customer who wants to find their product. And so many things are online, and so, you know, I've been working bit by bit of improving my website and improving the SEO or the search engine right. optimization yep. Yep. for anyone listening mm -hmm. um, so that people who are looking for products like mine can find me because it's all very well and good to raise pastured chicken and to raise pastured pork and for Amber and Logan to raise pastured turkey and beef. But if the person in the Twin Cities who's looking for this stuff can't find it, if they do a Google, Google search and nothing comes up, well, then that doesn't do anybody any good. So that's where the marketing piece has come in because, you know, just word of mouth isn't enough. Just having a sign at the end of the driveway isn't enough. And so that has been the big learning curve, is figuring out how to tell people that I have what they're looking for. Well, the, the website itself, and, and hopefully everybody will go check this, this out, it is so clean. I mean, it is. Thank you. I, I just, you know, and I'm terrible at, at doing websites. And, of course, my, my own website, I've got, you know, basically three different things going on. Um, with my podcasting and writing and whatever else, so it's a bit uh, a muddle that way. But your website is, I mean, it is precise, it is clean, it is incredibly easy to use. Um, the pictures are fantastic. Uh, so this is, you, you've done an excellent job with that. There's no doubt about that. Well, thank you. I really appreciate hearing that because I had no idea what I was doing and I cried a lot when I was making it. <laughs> Well, you have that great balance where, where it's just very, um, you know, and again, the, the best word and try not to be too redundant with it, but it is just clean and effective and the pictures are, are telling you everything and it's just, you know, it's very responsive and it's also very quick to get through, meaning that you, it's, it's laid out in a, in a very, you know, efficient manner as, as well. So when people are, are clicking on here, um, you just get to boom, boom, boom. It just makes it so 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 easy. So no, that that is working wonderfully. I, you well, know, thank you. That is really nice to hear. The the you know your story and and then and the other couple story is is I think you know the the story that's reinvigorating farming in Wisconsin and, and everywhere else where people are coming in and yeah the farm might have been used for you know a, a dairy operation at one point or something else. But now we're getting this kind of back to what the, the core of farming used to be, where your local farmer supplied the local market. The issue – oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. No, like, yes, that is, that is very much our focus. Yeah. And, you know, the, the issue that you're having with the price is kind of the same thing I have with, with, with my stuff a little bit in that you're, you're taking the time and energy to, to – essentially create a premium product and you there are going to people who who want that but then are also looking at and you know i i get this depending on you know who contacts me and, and from where uh well can i get it but at this price for this whatever and you know there, there's a certain point where you just can't do that and still make the margins you need to to make on the product because the work that you're putting into this and the type of farming this isn't where you have you know, 200 chickens in one big pen and you're feeding them till they get to a po certain point and then, you know, it, it's all over. This is a healthy, um, essentially, you know, disease-free, 
um, type of, of raising meat that gets the healthiest product to the consumer, but it, it's, you know, it's, I, I hate to use the, the word this way, it's not as efficient as, as some more industrialized farming, but it, the quality is so much better and so much healthier. Do you think you just need to educate people more in the local market, or do you think it's just a price point that um, will be more more difficult? And then not to add too many more questions here in, in one segment, but, you know, the Shatek area is a tourist area as well. You know, summer population explodes. Your product essentially comes to, um, you know, the, the, the newest product of that market comes a little bit later after maybe the tourist season is, is out. Is there a timing issue there where you might be able to take advantage of, of other people kind of coming in to, to buy the product? Or do you see uptakes of inquiries when, when the, the population of Barron County essentially doubles every summer? Can you kind of um, so, fit those so pieces together? Yeah, so that's, that's definitely the issue. Like the, it takes so much work to go into you know, producing this food um, that we just have to have a, a higher price point because, you know, when you're when you're moving chickens to fresh grass by hand every single day and, you know, moving an entire paddock of pigs every single week, you know, all of that labor and the equipment required, it costs, and there's just no way around that. I do think that for a lot of people, it is simply a price point. Um, you know, certainly for people who can afford food like what we offer, um, once they've had it, they frequently come back because it's really good. Yeah. You know, we just off like our meat tastes wonderful, and there's a lot of satisfaction in knowing where it came from and knowing the farmer. Um, but you know, if you've got a couple and they are both working in factory jobs, making sixteen dollars an hour and trying to raise two, two or three kids, there is no amount of budgeting. There is no amount of education that makes it possible to pay nine ninety five a pound for pork chop. And, you know, it's just an example, but like it just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And and I will say one of I do have a little bit of a soapbox on this because having had times in my life where I have had a very low income and had very little choices, there's just there's only so much that you can change when you just are living um, at a very low income level. And one thing that I find frustrating about some of my fellow <laughs> farmers, especially in the regenerative agriculture space, is that sometimes there's a tendency to blame consumers for not prioritizing well enough in order to buy our products. And I just think that's incredibly unfair. And I will always be the first person to say that, like, yes, I would love their business. But you know what? If you need to go to Aldi and buy all of your food there in order to feed your family nutritious, wholesome food, mm -hmm. then I think that you should do that. And don't feel guilty for a second. Because there are just certain price points that people cannot hit, mm -hmm. um, whether they have other expenses factoring into it or their income is at a certain level. And no amount of education or prioritization can change that. And I truly do not want someone to ever, you know, buy something from me and then worry about how they're going to pay their electricity bill. I really, really hope that that person does whatever they can to put food on their table from any source. Because as much as I think I raise a quality product and as proud as I am for how I produce food and how I treat my animals. The reality is, is that while our larger agriculture system might not be ideal, it does produce safe food. And so if people need to make choices about whether or not they can feed their family, pay their bills, you know, and like take their kids on a once a year two day vacation, I don't want them sacrificing in order to be able to pay my prices when it's really not reasonable for them to do so. I would prefer a world in which they could. I mean, I, I would prefer a world <laughs> in which they didn't have to make those sacrifices right, right. and make those choices. I would prefer a world in which um, locally produced food had a reasonable enough price point that it was accessible to every single person who lived here. 
Let's see. As far as tourists coming in, um, we were able to sell to a few tourists, but um, that is another area where I need to work on my marketing um, because tourists would need to be able to know about me before they come into town. Um, and then, so I have various ideas on that, and um, I probably will end up working with like the Chamber of Commerce and um, the Tourism Board because I would like to be able to reach out like through resort owners uh, to possibly, um, you know, ask them to let their clients know about different potentials for local food in the area. And so I would kind of need some logistics on, like, when would be a good time for pickup? Could we somehow offer uh, delivery to cabins ahead of time? Mm -hmm. uh, because I would love to, I would love for, you know, people to vacation in this area and then eat local food during that time. And, I mean, if I am vacationing, I would be delighted to be able to pick that up easily. But, of course, without good marketing, they have no way of even knowing that we exist. And so that's kind of what, you know, my challenge in learning more about marketing is all about is reaching the people that I need to reach because certainly the demand, the demand is there, but they need to know that I exist. Um, so I need to learn ways to tell them. So I'm definitely interested in that and kind of figuring it out. Yeah. As far as, um, you know, like a seasonal pattern to our purchases and to our, um, to our sales, we really haven't even been in business um, and at this level of business long enough to notice the pattern. Because typically, like before we started selling individual cuts of meat and we were only doing halves and holes of mm -hmm. the pigs, we would only sell in the fall. And then it wasn't until, I believe it was August of 2020, was the first time that we got um, pork cuts back from the butcher, and that was when we obtained our initial meat retail license from the county. So that was just over a year ago. So, so far, a lot of it has just been me marketing and trying <laughs> to figure things out. And then, of course, the shipping and reaching out to other areas has been a very, very slow ramp up. You know, we're starting to gain some traction. We're shipping out more. But it's definitely been a slow process because we're really small and everything is a learning curve. So I don't really have a good sense yet of, you know, what everything is going to look like. Because this time of year, last year, I wasn't shipping. But this time of year, this year, we shipped three turkeys. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of remains to be seen how that seasonal cycle is going to be. And I kind of forgot, was there one more question? Because I get focused and then I kind of go off on a tear and then I forget where I was to begin nope, with. Nope, that, that answers it. And, and working in, I'm doing the same thing, uh, doing, joining the uh, Chamber of Commerce there and just trying to, to tie in a little bit and kind of figuring out where um, where might be the best way to get, you know, to, to open up some some more markets and, and that. As you're, you know, going through this process, do you have other, you know, business people in the area that, you know, you kind of talk with, you know, kind of and any mentoring, anything along that line? Um, you know, you, you seem like you've been really good at finding a lot of differing resources um, that's helped guide you along, but have you been able to work with people who have been in business for, for quite a while? You know, I've talked with a few people, and of course, being from this area, I know everybody. Yes. So, you know, I have casual conversations with people. Um, we haven't really done much as far as, like, forming business alliances or working together, and part of that is that because we're still so small, like, we almost don't even have as much to offer. And, and of course, since last year, we were just barely managing to do everything, this has really been the first year that I'm even starting to kind of like get my arms around the concept of what are we as a business? Where do we want to go in the future? How are we going to get there? So I'm still very much in the early process of all of this. Like I have a ton of ideas, but implementing every single one of them, <laughs> you know, takes a long time. Um, you know, I would someday, I would dearly love to like provide pigs for catering. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, uh, the owners of Hope and Anchor are starting the coffee house, they're starting to do catering. And like, I would love to be able to provide pigs for them. And there's 
the mill in town, which is a wedding venue that was made out of an old feed mill. Mm -hmm. It's this amazing place. You know, so I would dearly love to partner with the caterer, to partner with the mill, so that we had options for providing, like, weddings and venues that do mm -hmm. all of this. But I'm so far away from that now <laughs> that, you know, at this point, it's just kind of ideas. Like, we're still, like, really getting a hold of shipping. Like, we're not even to the point of selling out all of our stock. So we're just very not far along the path of all of this. So while I have really great ideas, um, everything that I have implemented so far has taken about seven times longer than I hoped that it would. Um, and I say that about shipping, I say that about creating the website. So it's all just a very long process. So there's a lot of there's a lot of someday, but not yet. Right, right. Well, that's one of the things for um, with with honey, especially my other products are are a lot more conducive to to shipping. But honey being you know such a heavy product, shipping oh, yeah. is ridiculous. Um, from a, from a cost standpoint, so what has been kind of the the, the highest hurdle you've had to to get over the the last couple of years here of of making a go of this? I would really say so. Last year, I would say it was time. Um, trying to do all of this while both of us were working off the farm was incredibly overwhelming, and um, it was it was just really exhausting. And um, so that was last year. And then this year has been a lot of trying to catch up on all the business aspect, marketing aspect things that ideally we should have been doing all along. But I just, it just didn't have the bandwidth for everything. Right. So at this point, I would really say that marketing and reaching customers who want what I have to offer is probably the biggest hurdle. And you know, it's a hurdle just because I'm rural, um, trying to reach people, like trying to reach the right people is definitely a challenge. And since I started out knowing absolutely nothing about it, um, you know, the combination of learning about it and doing it while trying to grow a business, I say would probably be the biggest, you know, hurdle that I think I'm still really in the process of jumping. I wouldn't say that I've even cleared it yet. And what's your greatest success? I mean, what, what really has worked? better than you could have imagined in this process? Um, I think doing online ordering has been amazing. I've had multiple customers find me and buy from me because they could find me online. They could see what we offered, and they weren't having to guess. They didn't feel like they had to navigate, like, a special farmer code. They could just go online. It looked familiar, like, I can get this. And then on top of that, I would say repeat customers. You know, when when customers buy again because they, they bought something from me and they're like, this was so good, mm -hmm. and they come back and they want more. That is such an amazing feeling, um, you know, to just – to just know that we're that we're successful in producing a really high quality product that people want, like that is just an amazing feeling um, to have to just know that we're feeding people and that mm -hmm. we're feeding people well. So when I would consult with with new businesses, you know, you, the kind of the the standby is you know your first three to five years, you're not going to make any money to put into your own pocket, so it, it gets to be a, a bit of a, a tough road to hoe here. And then also being a nurse during a pandemic and starting a new business, how do you keep your sanity? Coffee. Um. <laughs> Hope and anchor. See, that's the answer to everything, right? Exactly. It all ties back together. <laughs> no, it's it's been interesting. Um, you know, I... I am fortunate in that I left inpatient um, three okay. and a half years ago before uh -huh. the pandemic. So I am no longer, I was a critical care nurse. Oh. And so I don't know how well I would be doing if I still was. Mm -hmm. um, so I left critical care, even though I loved it, um, because, I mean, I, I did in-hospital nursing for 15 years. So I was very done. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that I would be able to do both. If I was still doing critical care nursing, I, I just don't. Mm -hmm. Even in the clinic setting, um, there's a lot. You know, I sometimes pick up extra shifts. I do, um, I do the outpatient center for the monoclonal antibody infusion. Okay. I do yep. vaccines. I do phone triage. 
it's a lot. And fortunately, in the clinic setting, I'm able to have predictable hours, and I get lunch on a regular basis, and that's really great. So that makes a very big difference. Um, but it's still a lot, and, and it's just a challenge. You know, my, my big goal, with I'm hoping within the next three to four years, is that I would like to be able to cut back a bit. Um, I, I don't want to leave nursing entirely. I like it, um, but I would like to do it a little bit less. And, and that is definitely a hindrance in, you know, figuring out the marketing thing and the business thing is that I'm learning it, I'm doing it, and I'm still working a lot, and I'm still kind of tapped out. So to be frank, it's just a struggle that I don't have a good answer for, um, but I just kind of do it. And, um, you know, over time it's certainly gotten better, mm -hmm. and things have gotten easier, and, you know, as I learn more, it's not as much of a struggle. Um, but it, it definitely is, is there. And that thing about the, the three to five years is no joke. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're not in a position yet where we're really like pulling in an income. I kind of joke that I'm really in nursing to support my farming habit. Exactly. But there's a big on ramp. And, yeah. and that is, you know, that's such a big barrier um, in agriculture. You know, there's this very idyllic vision of like, go back to the land and right. raise some food and sell it and you'll be fine. And, you know, that's a well and good, but you got to buy the land or lease the land. You got to get the equipment. You got to figure out how you're going to make an income. It has to be enough of an income. And we were incredibly fortunate in that, you know, we were in our late 30s by mm -hmm. the time we purchased this land and we both had careers. Right. And I don't know how somebody would do it if they were much younger or if they were, you know, if they didn't have those resources, if they didn't have a job that they could work that paid them well, that gave them health insurance, and they tried to start farming. And I don't want to discourage anybody from doing that. Mm -hmm. I just think that the, the reality of this romantic notion that we can, you know, produce food and people will buy it and we'll be able to live off of that money, it's, it's not always that pretty and clean. And there's some really big barriers that are in place in order for people to start farming. And it's been really challenging for us, and we are coming from a place of, of enormous privilege. So to try to picture that same situation for people who don't have all the legs up that we have already had, um, that's, it's, I don't want to say that it's insurmountable because I, I always want to encourage people to do it, and right. I hope that as time goes on, I can be a resource um, for people mm -hmm. to start being successful farmers. But there are some really big barriers in place. Well, and ultimately, if we want to get to a place of regional food production and, and feeding one another within our communities, we're going to have to figure out how to break down those barriers. And I don't even pretend to have the answers. Well, um, but you're a couple like so many couples that are in farming where there is a person who has that day job because of the benefits, because you don't mm -hmm. make enough farming if you've been doing it for 20 years often to be able to afford you know health care and, and all that as as well um so that's that's kind of a, a a normal situation where you need to have somebody who's um you know kind of has that regular professional job for for the health benefits benefits and and everything else but i th i don't think it's discouraging so much as it's a realistic picture and it is hard to do what you're doing because I think you're right. You know, you see in a lot of different places where, you know, people are saying, well, just go back to the land and do exactly like you said, but that's a tough road to hold. I mean, it is a lot of work. It's a lot of, um, a lot of stress, a lot of not knowing. And if you have a bad year, you can be done. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had something that ran through your herd of pigs, right? How yeah, do you recover like from what that? what do we do? Yeah. And right. that's the nature of farming. It doesn't matter what kind of, if you're a crop farmer, dairy farmer, livestock farmer, you can have one bad year and that can be devastating. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have nothing to fall back on, mm -hmm. which is why I, I have joked to my supervisor that <laughs> if she ever wants me to leave my current job, she's going to have to pry me out with a curl bar <laughs> because... <laughs> I mean, I, I do like it, mm -hmm. um, but also there's that level of security of, you know, so we now have our own business 
and our revenue is completely up to us and it varies a lot and it's, it's all based on skill set and weather and luck and all sorts and shipping mm-hmm. and all sorts of things. Yes. But we have that paycheck coming in every two weeks and that makes an enormous difference. It makes an enormous difference in our ability to weather risk. Mm-hmm. Um, it helps in the decisions that we make because it just it keeps us away from that edge and it keeps us from being like afraid and desperate. And so, while we're certainly not re- reckless, I am not a risk taker <laughs> by any definition. Let me tell you, 10 years in working trauma ICU, uh-huh. no risk taking. Right. You, you saw a lot of <laughs> um, risks being taken. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. And so, and, it, and I will say it's not just physical risk. It just kind of extends to, like, it really makes you think about, like, what are all the potential outcomes. Um, but it does give us more of an ability to take chances um, because we know that we have a fallback. You know, we know that thanks to my income, we can pay our mortgage. Mm -hmm. Um, So that kind of gives us the ability to try this. And, you know, obviously we really hope that this becomes a success and it becomes, you know, a a supporting enterprise and that it grows and we want to grow and offer people good jobs and we want to reach out to other producers and help them get started. We have all these dreams. But if we're not successful, because the reality is we might not be, Mm -hmm. you know, I would love to say that all of this is set and that like, yep, I'm good at this and we're going to do this and it's all going to be great. But the reality is, is that I could still fail. And, and as much as I don't want that to happen, if I do, we're still going to have a roof over our heads and we're still going to have enough to eat, more than enough to eat, actually, because if we don't sell this, (laughs) we have so much food. (laughs) Exactly, like be in the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> but that position gives us an ability to make decisions mm-hmm. that would be very hard to make in other circumstances. And it's it's given us, you know, a lot of, of comfort and security and let us kind of take the time to really think about things and decide how we want to approach them. And I don't know that we would have made the same decisions if we were making them with some fear involved. And certainly it could be argued that, like, maybe it's good to have some fear that you take more chances, but that's not me. <laughs> and well, and um, so I, I feel very fortunate to, to not have to make the choice of, like, hey, we either, you know, try this or we risk bankruptcy. It's mm-hmm. more of like, a, well, that would be a substantial step back, and I would be incredibly disappointed, um, but we can still pay our mortgage. Right. Well, and the way that it's set up, or at least my perception looking from the outside, is it's scalable either way. Right. So let's say you keep trying to go, you know, forward and, and getting larger and you, you, you hit a point where, you know, maybe you've gone too far or what have you. You can dial it back and it's still, you know, it may not be the full supporting, you know, five people kind of business, but it is still a, a business that is paying for itself and, and adding benefit to 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 you um, that way as, as well. Um, so again, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the way that you've got it set up, um, it kind of like an accordion, you know, it, it can continue to expand or it can be brought back in depending on, on what the need is, but there's, there's one yes, more topic, very much so. one more topic I want to get to be, be before we end the interview and, and that's food sovereignty and mm-hmm. kind of controlling of how, you know, the product goes through the market and all that. Could you talk a little bit about that and kind of explain that concept and and why it's important? Absolutely. Now, I will say I'm certainly not the expert to talk about here. Um, You know, I have, there's knowledge that I have mostly because I have, you know, looked at what other people have um, Mm -hmm. have said. And, you know, for example, Linda Black Elk um, and Chris Newman of Sylvanaco Farms and Amber Tam, like they all talk about these issues and know much more than I do. So I can pair it a little bit, um, but I also don't want to give the impression that like these are my ideas that I'm owning. Um, the ability of people to feed themselves, I believe, is a fundamental human right. And it ha- it is one that there are so many barriers in place. And of course, the biggest barrier is land access, mm-hmm. because we can say that someone has a legal right to raise their own food. But if they don't even have anywhere to go to do that, do they really have a meaningful right to raise their own food? And then, of course, you get into different laws. And, of course, 
I'm very fortunate living in a rural area. Um, I'm already in farm country. I'm already on a farm. No one is questioning my ability to raise food Mm -hmm. for myself and for my community. And I do have to go through certain regulations, but most of the regulations are okay-ish. You know, I, I don't think that every single one of them is quite necessary, but overall, they're not insurmountable. However, there are so many areas um, of the country where people really don't have the ability uh, to produce their own food, you know, whether community gardens are outlawed or people can't have backyard chickens or backyard rabbits. I, I kind of wish those laws would be struck down as unconstitutional. <laughs> don't see that happening, but, you know, I can dream. Mm-hmm. And but I think it's so very fundamental because the way everything is right now is that we have this incredibly giant, cumbersome, fragile system. And I think a lot of people who are kind of on the inside of how food is produced recognize how fragile the system is. But it wasn't until the spring of 2020 when it became glaringly obvious that with all of our incredibly lean manufacturing, and lean is not necessarily a bad thing, but it can be overdone. Mm-hmm. And we have created systems where everything is just in time. Everything is is done like just barely, mm-hmm. just in time, not well stocked. And it really didn't take much to break the supply chain. Um, because really when we think about it, yes, there were shutdowns and yes, COVID was coming. But the pandemic hadn't truly struck everywhere because here – Nobody was sick. There were no cases yet in Barron County, and yet there were empty food shelves, and there were, you know, empty paper product shelves. And so it just showed us how there was absolutely no robusticity. And so I do believe that regional food production is absolutely key to food sovereignty and independence and food security and national security as a result, because if we can't feed ourselves, there's nothing else that we can do. And if we had more regional food production systems, then we would have had the ability to help other areas from the, of the country when they got hit. Because if there are multiple meat plants, then there's a place to go. But instead, you know, we only have, what is it, three companies that control the vast majority. It's either three or five it's, uh, companies yeah, that control the vast majority of meat in the United States. So they shut down, and then there was nothing. And if we really had a robust regional food production system, that wouldn't have happened at all. Because if you can can have an outbreak of COVID in one plant, but if you have all these other plants throughout the country, you still have options. Mm -hmm. And so I really think that food sovereignty is a combination of a fundamental human civil rights issue, but it's also just a life security issue. Um, Because if we don't have regional food production, then we have no option. And we saw that especially in the in the pork industry where, you know, there are a couple major plants in the country. One of them went down and, and pork prices just skyrocketed and people had no place to, to, to take their pigs to. I mean, it's yeah. just amazing how, you know, that whole thing, you know, goes back um, down onto the farmer and then you're having people who have hogs that they can't get rid of, you know, and it's just... It's a complete dismal failure, and it's one of those things that you know. As you build, I'm I'm a I'm big on building resiliency into all kinds of systems. It doesn't matter what what it is, and in our food system, if we don't look at this and learn from it, because it makes us it's it's a huge security issue. Because if it you really is. if you can do something to one or two plants, and now you have essentially frozen out an entire food group or, you know, and and, and industry and what that does and what it does to prices and, you know, the extra costs. And, you know, as we're talking earlier about how, yeah, not everybody can afford certain types of of food um, and and that type of thing. But then when you get the, you know, you kind of your most, um, uh, your, your, your lower price um, uh, sources of, of, of meat and that, go skyrocketing up then they're not they don't have access to any type of protein of meat protein like that this is it's it's a big issue and having the diverse diversification of sources 
and each area, you know, because you can have, again, you can have a larger regional, but having more of the local options there that are kept, um, you know, they're not going to become a, a, a $10 million business, but it is a food supplier locally, regionally, statewide, nationally. You have all these differing ones playing their pieces. So if any one area goes down, as you said, now you can help supply the, the you know, the, the area that, that is run into that, into that issue. So exactly. I, I just, you know, and I hadn't given that topic much thought. I'm going to actually be writing an article on it for um, a, another publication um, as I've been doing some research on, on food sovereignty. But um, I want to give you credit for kind of introducing me a little bit more. And I'd seen it more on a global scale where you're looking at, you know, a lot of different countries that aren't able to provide, you know, nationwide their own food sources. But I hadn't thought of it from kind of that local community level, which personally I'm ashamed of because I'm a local community guy and that's my whole <laughs> reason for for doing podcasts and everything else um but is, nobody is because can of that. see everything right yeah um so i want to thank you for that because that's it, it's it's integral part of of good of a good community of having all of these different things and you see it a lot farmers markets you know vegetables and that type of thing but looking at it from the 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 meat side of things um and maybe it's just because there's a lot more that goes into it a lot more regulation that you have to follow and everything else but having yeah. suppliers um, like Spring Hill is is important to those local communities for sure. And I just want to put a plug in again on the website as we're here. I, I, I became I registered on your site. It takes less than a minute. Um, so when oh, people nice. go to um, Spring Hill Heritage Farm, um, it's you know. When you look at it and it says, okay, you need to register or whatever um, to see pricing and that, don't be put off by that. It's super simple. It doesn't ask you, you know, what your, um, you know, third grade teacher was or anything like that. It's super simple to get uh, registered on the on there. Um, and then you get all kinds of great information and everything. So I just wanted to uh, well, let everybody so know that. So, okay. Now, oh. Anything you'd uh, like to share that we, we haven't covered that you think, you know, people really need to know about what it is that um, that you do? Oh, gosh. I think that's it. I mean, I, I think the only other, like, little soapbox that I tend to share and that I, I think this is one of those little hidden benefits of local agriculture is that local food production, production makes communities a better place to live. Um, because being able to source your food, it's not just about the food. It's about people having thriving careers within the community. It's also a quality of life issue. Um, for example, we've had several friends who have had family photos taken out on the uh, here on the farm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like we have a very picturesque old red barn with stone walls and ivy climbing them. And that's just a small example, but being able to come out to a farm, to an operating farm, and talk with someone and just experience, like, the peacefulness mm -hmm. of the country and see where your food is being produced, but also just to, to be here, to have family photos done, you know, to, to let your kids run around in the field and burn off some energy. Those things make everybody's quality of life better. So if there are more farmers who are producing food, that benefits the community. But the community also benefits simply by the presence of a, of a vibrant rural culture mm -hmm. so that they have some place to go that's not urban. And conversely, farmers have a place to go that is urban. Um, I love my farm, but sometimes I want to go to the theater. Right, right, right. So I, I think my other just big thing is, is that it's more than food. You know, it's an entire... Um, life and culture and various other offerings that just make life better and make every community more. Thank you, Marissa, for joining us today. Really a lot of good, insightful information here. And I want to thank the audience for listening. Um, check us out over on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, 
TikTok at Wimmer's Wilderness. And make sure to like, subscribe, follow that good stuff. It takes you about five seconds to do it and helps us out tremendously. And head over to Wimmer'sWilderness.org to check out all of our great B products. We have our grade A raw honey there. We have lip balm and our bees wax candles. Um, we ship, uh, there's some free delivery areas there as well. All of that is at the bee page. Uh, when you go to womerswilderness.org, it'll be one of your first options to, to head over um, there. And there's a lot of other great things for you to check out on that site as well. So please tell your friends, family, and heck, even your frenemies uh, what we're doing here at Wimmer's Wilderness Podcast.